Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you all out here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're just going to go right into a song to start things off today. As everyone is showing up and finding a place to sit, we invite you to join in. Really nice, relaxed time to gather and um, 
hang out together, just have fun and eat food and enjoy being in community with each other. And so we have a cookout this coming week at the home of Carmen and Alex Bridget. And um, each of you, if you got the handout packet when you walk in, it has lyrics for this morning in it and some other things. There is like a little postcard size thing that has the Good Riches address on it. So um, hang on to that. We'd love to see you. Anyone is welcome to be. Um, and it really is just a completely low key opportunity to hang out. Um, also, in the handout you got, there's a giving envelope, and we do have a giving box there um, on the table with the giving tablecloth. Um, and there's on the box, there's a little poster um, that shows a couple different ways to give here at Threads, including online. Um, so, uh, if you consider Threads your church home, that participating in giving is part of our worship, and it's part of how we love together, love each other well as community, and how we love our wider community well. Also, there's a connection card. If you are new or newer to Thread, we would love for you to fill that out just so that we get um, your name, your pronouns, your email address. Um, all we do with those is we, um, I'll send you an email that says, you know, hey, it's good to have you with us. Um, and just that way we make that connection so that we can potentially connect further going forward. Um, so we'd love for you to fill that out. If you fill one of those out, you can just stick it in the little giving box. There's also a large giving box in the entryway of the building. You're welcome to put it in there as well. Um, I believe that is all. I guess I will mention one more thing. During the summer, we have two things happening on Wednesday evenings. At 6 o'clock on Wednesdays, we have a book discussion group where we are just consistently reading through something by a theologian or Christian thinker of color. And so right now, we are uh, reading through Howard German's book, um, Jesus in the Book of uh, And then we draw to the end of that, and we'll choose another book which is just a perpetual thing that we are doing. Um, and then on, on, at 7 on Wednesdays, we have something called the Spiritual Thought Workshop, where anyone is welcome to come and be part of the conversation as we prepare for the upcoming week of spiritual thought. So it's part Bible study, um, part you know, communal, communal listening to the Spirit and brainstorming around um, what we're going to be talking together about on a Sunday morning. So anyone and, and everyone are welcome to both of those things, which have both an online option and are in person at my home. But this Wednesday, we do not have them. So I just want to make that clear. This Wednesday, I am going to be um, on retreat at um, a place called the Hermitage. We're going to be taking some silent retreat, and I love your prayers <laughs> um, while I do that. But we will not have those meetings this week, so I'll resume the following week. So that's all I have as far as announcements. And before we continue um, in worship through music, I am going to have us participate together in our welcoming affirmation. So I would invite everyone to stand in body or spirit and to face um, the pulse sort of across the lot from you and repeat this after me. You are loved. You are welcome. You belong in this place and in God's family. And now we're going to hear the first word. Thank you. 
said, her mind said, Rebecca, if you go ahead and do the non-consecutive prayer, yeah. if you haven't seen that movie, you I recommend it highly. It's possibly the funniest movie ever made. At least it's in the top five. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to be reading Psalm 87 this morning, and I'm going to read it from the message. And I just want to give one uh, point right before I read. The, the word Zion appears four times in this reading uh, in referring to a city. The word Zion refers, and you see this in the Bible, it refers normally to the city of Jerusalem. And when you hear Zion, think Jerusalem, okay? A Korah sign. Korah was a division of the Levites who, at this particular time, uh, were involved in writing music. Making a few songs. A Torah song. He founded Zion on the holy mountain. And oh, how God loves his home. Loves it far better than all the homes of Jacob put together. God's hometown. Oh, everyone is talking about me. I named them off those among whom I'm famous. Egypt. And Babylon, also Philistia, even Tyre along the coast. Words getting around, they point them out. This one was born again here. The words getting out on Zion, men and women, right and left, get born again in her. God registers their names in his book. This one, this one, and this one. Born again, right here. Singers and dancers give credit to Zion. All my strengths are in you. Thank you. 
Every week we focus on a particular faith practice, either confession or lament or intercession, praise or thanksgiving, in order to communally come before the Lord with every part of our lives and our hearts. So this morning we are going to engage together in a practice of confession. And Many of us are coming from all different kinds of faith backgrounds. Some of us not coming from a faith background. Some of us coming from faith backgrounds that were wrapped up with a lot of shame and a lot of self-loathing, a lot of focus on sort of the sinfulness of humanity. And so particularly for those who came from that kind of a background, the practice of confession can be very... um, loaded. And so I always want to take a moment and put a bit of context around this, because we tend to think of confession as simply coming before God um, with confession of our sins. And that is certainly part of it, but I want to invite us, I believe the Holy Spirit is inviting us into a practice of confession that is much deeper and much more holistic. And so I think a helpful parallel this morning is a garden parallel. That we are in the middle of the hot part of summer. Raise your hand if you do any kind of gardening, whether it be vegetables or grow some flowers. Yeah, a good proportion of us here. And so you know that at this time of the year when we're getting a lot of um, rain and a lot of heat and a lot of sunlight, um, there are quite a few weeds that grow up alongside our vegetables and our flowers, right? And that, I think, is a really helpful parallel when we think about confession. Confession is opening our hearts up to God, not only to our own particular sins, either in the things that we've done, that we, that we wish we hadn't have done, the things we haven't done, that we know we should have, but also in anything that we might be aware of that is choking out the life that God wants for us. Anything that is growing up and twisting its tendrils around us that is stealing our nourishment, right? Like weeds do in our garden. Um, Stealing our you know, our, our nourishment and our life and our ability to thrive and grow. When we open our hearts up in confession, we're saying, God, will you shine your light on the weeds that have been growing up alongside the growth in my life? Help me to see what they are, to identify them. And Lord, with your help, uh, can you, through the power of your spirit, root those out so that I can flourish? And so that I can be the beautiful, growing creation you've made me to be. Sometimes, um, when you talk to folks who have been hurt by past um, iterations of, of faith or church, 
you'll hear people feel very strongly, um, people have a real strong reaction to sin talk and can feel like, I don't really think sin is a thing in my life other than, you know, it's only like just hurting somebody else, right? And I think there are ways in which we can say, well, you might say the weeds in my garden aren't hurting my neighbor's garden. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to have any beautiful bouquets to share with my neighbor if I just let the weeds grow untapped. I'm not going to have a bushel of tomatoes to carry over and share, right? And so, um, ultimately, the things that are choking out the light and life in my own heart do impact those around me, which is going to limit me from being fully who God has created me. So what I want us to do, we're just going to take a few moments of silence, and we have children present, and we're in the neighborhood, and we've got birds chirping, so this will be um, the silence of your heart, no matter what noise might be going around um, in the external world. But I invite you to just take a few moments to check in with God, the master gardener, and to ask God, Point out maybe some weeds that are choking out the life that God wants for you. Maybe that is um, busyness. Maybe it's um, not enough sleep. <laughs> maybe it is um, something that you've gotten wrapped up in that you're realizing, mm, this isn't maybe leading me to the flourishing that I want to. So let's just take a few moments and ask the Holy Spirit to speak, to identify those things in our lives. We will just, without shame or condemnation, just lift them up to the Lord and ask God and God's tremendous grace and mercy to keep shining God's light there and to keep helping us um, to courageously allow the Spirit to root out the weeds so that we can flourish um, in the way that God wants for us to flourish. Spirit, we thank you for your faithful work and presence in our lives as our, our gardener and our shepherd and the lover of our souls. Lord, you don't look at the weeds in our hearts and spirits and condemn us or shame us. You want us to thrive. You want us to be fully free as the people you've created us to be. And we ask that you would continue to walk forward with us into the day and into the week to come. And that you would continue to bring this to mind and just help us to continue to commune with you and continue to allow you to shine your light in our hearts, to lift our hearts to confession in a way that leads to flourishing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to invite any kids who are here who would like to, to come um, just sit up here by me for a second and chat. Everybody feeling a little bit shy this morning? 
<laughs> All right, maybe I'll just chat with you from here. Anybody want to come up here? <laughs> All right, I'll just talk long distance to you kiddos. All right? Um, so, do you guys like to be creative? Yeah, what kinds of things do you like to do that is creative? Zoe, what do you like to do that's creative? Legos? I thought you were going to say that. Yep. And you play drums and you sing. Yeah, anybody else? What do you like to do that's creative? Does anybody like to draw or paint or dance? Yeah. Well, did you know that in the Bible, the very first thing we learn about God, the very beginning of the Bible, is that God is creator. And then we learn that God made us in God's image. And that means that we're like God in a way none of the rest of the creatures are. And that means that we get to be creators too. We create things. So Joey, did you know that when you make Legos, or when you guys draw or paint or dance, that that is you being partners with God in bringing new creation into the world. Isn't that cool to think about? And I want you to think about that the next time you do something creative. That you're actually being friends and partners with God when you create. All right, I'm going to pray for you guys a second, and then you can go to kids' community, okay? Lord God, I thank you for all the kids of Threads, those who are here this morning, and those who aren't, those who may be joining online. We ask for your blessing upon them. We ask that you would help them to be aware of um, your delight in them and with them when they um, create from the joy of their heart. And I ask that you bless them now as they go to kids' community, that they would more deeply know and experience you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you guys are heading out with Miss Laura. And we'll see you back in a little while. So this morning, we adults are also going to be talking about creativity um, in the life of following Jesus and why um, creativity in our lives is a unique path into the experience of the wonder and delight of God. And so um, before I read our passage for this morning and get into the spiritual talk, I am going to invite my mom, Deb Fluke, to come up and share just a little bit about what creative expression has looked like in her life. Thank you. 
So this is going to be our final talk in the current series um, on wonder, uh, nurturing delight in a God-shaped world. And I think it's really apt and, and delightful that our uh, final talk is about our invitation to be co-creators uh, with God. And so thank you, Mom, for your story. And um, you're going to hear me echo some of those thoughts that um, we all are called to some kind of creativity. Um, so, we'll get into all of that, but let's first read our passage. So this morning, we're going to read from Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25, and I'm reading from the NRSV. This is the prophet Isaiah presenting the word of the Lord. So this is from the perspective of God. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there, there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered a curse. Then he shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree, shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. But they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So I'm excited to dig in to this word of the Lord more in a few minutes. Before we do, though, I'm actually going to have us take a few moments for some discussion. So I would encourage you to kind of group up with a couple of people who are near you and just take a minute to reflect on how does creativity show up in your life? In what ways 
do you find yourself delighting in creative expression? So just take a minute and chat with some folks near you about that. Take about half a minute to wrap up. Reconvene here. So I would love to hear if anyone wants to share what is the way that creativity shows up in your life. Feel free to raise your hand or just call it out. Our our kids help us be creative. Yes, absolutely. Do you have any examples of how that? Looks. Make believe cooking, yes. Yup. Yeah, I think there is a childlikeness that we have to engage in order to really be creative. Yeah. Um, both. <laughs> you let your weeds grow and enjoy the beauty of the. <laughs> there are beautiful. There are a lot of things we call weeds that are actually very beautiful, right? I think there's a child like this required to see that too. Jamie, did you have your hand raised? Amy was saying her dad's aunt used to quilt and would choose colors that you'd think at first glance, well, how do those go together? But when it was all together as a whole quilt, it was beautiful. Yeah, that's a wonderful example. Anyone else? Okay. Kate likes to garden and argues that she does not let the weeds grow. <laughs> yeah, you appreciate when creativity shows up in, in writing because you enjoy reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You love singing and dancing. Yeah. 
all the singers and dancers will say, all my fountains are in you. Well, if you're very well versed in the Hebrew scriptures or in the history of the Hebrew people, You might be aware that the people group named in that psalm are the traditional enemies of Israel. And in that, in that psalm, we are hearing glimmers of new creation. The psalmist is glimpsing that a day is coming when God will say, They are in my book. They were born here too. They are written in my book. And so throughout the Hebrew scriptures, you get glimpses of this new creation. And then the New Testament writers take this up. And um, we see it particularly in the writings of Paul and in John's uh, book of Revelation, where these writers understood that in some miraculous way, this promised new creation has broken into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, through his life and death and resurrection, ushered in a new reality in which God's people can experience and participate in this new creation now, in the middle of history, even as we anticipate the day when Christ will return and usher in that reality in full. So, an example of this is in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18, where the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So God in Christ is establishing new creation. This new creation is marked by reconciliation and healing. And we are invited not simply to benefit from it, not simply to watch in awe as new creation unfolds, but we are invited to join in God's creative work. And God invites us to do this right here and now, in the midst of our regular, messy, broken lives. I'm going to refer quite a bit this morning to an author named Makoto Fujimura, who is a Japanese-American um, artist who has written profoundly on the um, intersection of art and faith. And he writes, New creation fills in the cracks and fissures of our broken, splintered lives, and a golden light shines through, even if only for a moment, reminding us of the abundance of the world that God created and that God is yet to create through us. The new creation that began when Jesus was himself raised from the dead is the true light of God's coming age already visible precisely in the golden light that shines through, in art, in the Eucharist, which is a fancy word for communion, in the entire mission of the church. That mission reverses the travel direction of the pilgrims going up to Jerusalem. We are told to go down into the places where the world is still dark. So we are called to walk with Jesus, to join Jesus on the pilgrim's way, on the way of the cross. And we are invited to partner with God as co-creators, bringing through the power of the Holy Spirit the light and abundance and freedom that are originally in God into the places of suffering and scarcity and fear. That is our holy calling. That is our work within God's new creation. But that word work might not be highly appealing to all of us. You might be thinking, but I don't want more work. <laughs> isn't, isn't it enough 
Do I have to labor and toil just to make it in this world? It's more than I can handle to even think about joining God in God's work, too. So God's message for us here is good news on two fronts. First, even our work that feels like labor and toil, just our daily to day work, the sweat of our brow, the energy we expend day after day in the course of normal life, God is saying here, that work is not in vain. Whether that work is changing diapers or mowing lawns, wiping runny noses, filing taxes, working on an assembly line, fixing cars, or anything else we find ourselves doing in the course of regular life. If, when we are new creation, when we are in Christ, our work can be done in a way that it is offered to God and to the world as a gift, and that God blesses it in some mysterious way that makes it full of meaning, permanent somehow, in God's new creation. Even if, in the moment, it feels like nothing more than toil and struggle. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul echoes Isaiah 65 when he writes, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So the thing is, you don't have to be engaged in specifically religious or spiritual seeming or charitable or humanitarian work for, for you to be about the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord has to do with every inch of the good creation God brings into existence and adores. The work of the Lord is at play whenever we join God in bringing the realities of new creation to bear in our lives, in our relationships, in our attitudes, in our work. And so if anyone is in Christ, new creation is at work and present, and our labor is not in vain. So I hope this is a freeing word this morning, particularly for those of you who maybe have um, struggled with guilt or a feeling like you're not somehow doing enough for God, that somehow you're not pulling your weight in God's kingdom. That is not the voice of God. God can breathe life and goodness and healing into the world, in and through you, right where you are, in the work that you do, just by being authentically who God created you to be, and by seeking to follow the way of Christ, empowered by the Spirit in your everyday life. So all our work is meaningful, holy, and miraculously made lasting through the power of Christ in the reality of new creation. But there is a kind of work that we are called to that is uniquely aligned with the heart of God. There is work God has for us each to do that is special within the realm of new creation. So that's what I want to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about. And as I alluded to with the kids, it helps us to think back to the very beginning of the story of God's um, revealing of God's self to humankind. God is revealed before anything else as creator. Before there was any sin, before there was law, before there was any brokenness to redeem or any wounds to heal, before everything began, what we see of God's character is that God is one who creates. God is creator of every galaxy, every planet, every ocean, tree, and flower, every creature, and every single human being. God is creator, and the witness of Scripture is God did not create out of any lack within God's self, did not create out of any need. God was not lonely. 
God did not need humans um, in order to be kind of God's lackeys on earth, as was the story with many other ancient beliefs about God. God creates simply and entirely out of lavish, exuberant, overflowing love. God is an imaginative, imaginative maker, a passionate artist. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece. And in the abundance of God's goodness, we humans are given a commission to be co-creators with God, to join in this exuberant, overflowing love that creates not for the purpose of any utility, not for the purpose of usefulness or efficiency or profitability, but simply because of love. God made humans in the image of God's self. And a huge part of what that means for us is that we are innately makers. We are creative. Dorothy Sayers wrote that the characteristic common to God and humankind is apparently the desire and the ability to make things. But we live in a culture that highly values people's ability to make things. As long as that making fits into a system of productivity, usefulness, efficiency, and profit. And yet the way of Christ, the realm of God's new creation, refuses to abide by those conditions. In Christ, we are each invited into an identity as makers and co-creators who are driven not by profit or by the plot or by anxiety or by usefulness, but who are motivated and moved by self-giving love and a connection with the creative heart of God. Wendell Berry understood this when he wrote, Every day, do something that won't compete. When we engage in creative expression simply out of an overflow of love, because we've lifted our eyes up away from the economy of utility and scarcity, when our hearts have been drawn toward the transcendent, and we respond by creative expression, we are on God's wavelength. That does not compute with the systems and the economies of the world. That's why Wendell Berry says in the same paragraph, practice resurrection. Every day, do something that won't compute. Practice resurrection. When we tap into our creative gifts, when we become makers, fueled by the delight of God, we join with God in bringing something new. New creation into the world. And that is indeed practicing resurrection. When we carve out time to play music while the clock ticks away behind us, we are living into abundance in the face of scarcity. When we bake something with care and love, even though it would have been quicker and easier to just go buy something from the store, we are giving lives to scarcity and living into abundance. When we create something beautiful, knowing full well that ugly, heartbreaking things are happening all around us, we participate in the abundance of God in the face of the world's scarcity. We are not ignoring the suffering and ache of the world. We're not using our, our, our creative expression as an escape, as a way to kind of tune out the, the ugly, um, and instead to just stay positive. When we are authentically creative alongside God, we are actually doing exactly the opposite. When we allow the spirit of God the Creator to work in and through us, when we 
create beauty and make art even when the world is growing. We are creating space for new hope and redemption to take root. Ruby Wormout writes that artists operate out of abundance and hope. He says that there is an abundance at the place of creation, and that art is a way of tapping into that abundance. There is a newness always at work in the world that was breathed into existence by God. So when we make art, when we engage in creative expression, um, and partner with God in that way, that is um, that is a participation in new creation. Making them is a defined act of joy and hope in the midst of darkness. It's a participation in what John chapter 1 calls the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So Fuji Mura has a little more to say about that joy and hope. He writes, Joy and hope are not saccharine. The gospel hope is different from sentimental hope. And gospel joy is different from sentimental joy. So what's the difference? Gospel hope and joy are born out of pain and difficulty and darkness, but they are also connected with divine love, which is excessive, gratuitous, and beautiful. In John 15, Jesus tells us that God has called us not to be servants, but friends. And as friends of God, God is pouring into our own hearts that same divine love, which is excessive, gratuitous, and beautiful. In our making, in our creating, we are establishing through the power of the Holy Spirit more and more signposts of that divine love in the midst of a growing world. So our making in artistic and creative expression pushes back against the spirit of the world that values only utility and efficiency and profit. Our joyful and exuberant making is a signpost of the love and abundance of God and a sign of hope to a growing world. And then making is also a form of knowing. When we make, when we create, in the knowledge and presence of God, we come to know God in a deeper, more transcendent and intangible way than we could ever know God through memorizing doctrines or precepts or well-ordered arguments. Our hearts are open in creativity. Our spirits are tuned to the deep things. And so it is also true that very often, as we open ourselves up in creativity, all our grief and pain and shame and brokenness come to the surface. We long to find expression for our pain. We want to seek, uh, we want to create beauty from the ashes of our disappointments. We see the groaning of the world and, and want to give it voice. But also we grapple with shame as we create and find ourselves tempted to compare our work with that of others. We grieve our inability to bring uh, to fruition the beauty we can see in our mind's eye. And so it is right here, right in the middle of that vulnerable mix as we rip and ache that we create that God comes to us and blesses us and seek redemption and new creation over us. It is right in and through that experience of brokenness and imperfection as we try to bring our creative gifts to bear that God becomes more fully known to us. As we move forward in that vulnerability and create from that space, God meets us and says, but that's just the ticket. 
That's exactly what I was looking for, to adorn and fill my new creation. As we lean into the vulnerability required to create, as we pour out our creative hearts before God, we will know God more deeply and find ourselves more deeply and fully beloved. So, again, some of you might be thinking, well, that's great for the creative folks among us, but that's not me. I'm really not creative. And as Bab said this morning, that is just simply not true. What is it that makes your heart sore? What slows you down and leads you into contemplation? What brings you joy in the sharing of it? Maybe your creativity shows up to musical expression, writing songs, playing an instrument, singing or whistling. Um, even our singing together in worship is creative expression. It's a holy making of communal beauty. Maybe you're a maker in gardening or flower arranging, or you write. Maybe you paint or draw. Um, maybe you bake, maybe you cross it or knit, embroider, or sew. Maybe you make slides for slide fixing, or you enjoy woodworking. Or as my mom alluded to, maybe you are just someone who thinks outside the box, or you're creative and fun things for your friends to do together, or you have, you have a creative sense of humor. I promise you, God made you creative. And it is possible, though, that you have spent your lifetime being lied to and told that you're not creative, or telling yourself that you don't have time to create, or you feel that creative expression is a waste because you're not the best at it, or because you don't profit from it. But in the economy of God's kingdom, the creative expression of your heart matters. The busy air traffic day must be like catching up from the Microsoft outage. <laughs> so your gifts are counted as precious in the new creation, completely regardless of how you might think they can share with anybody else's offering. God counts your beautiful watercolor painting or your slightly burnt puppet to cookies as the work of a co-creator and as an essential and beautiful and beloved part of God's new creation. So I'll end by borrowing once more from Fujimura this morning. So you have a picture on your handout of a bowl, and um, this has gotten a little bit kind of popular because it's so easy to draw sort of a metaphor from. But um, it is truly a beautiful thing. And Japan is this very unique art form called Kintsugi. And the story of Kintsugi's origins goes back to 15th century Japan. No one really knows the actual story, but it's kind of the story that's built up around it when a particular shogun accidentally broke his favorite tea bowl, and he sent it to China for repair. And it came back held together by metal strips, which was functional and efficient, but not beautiful. So he sent it then to Japanese um, artisans and asked them if they could repair it differently. And so what they did is they combined their lacquer with gold dust, and filled, put it back together in a way that all the breakages of the bowl were accentuated and made beautiful. So this is what new creation means for us as makers. God invites us in all our imperfections, in our humanness, in our brokenness, to participate in God's new creation. And as we bring our open hearts, as we vulnerably create as friends of God and co-creators of Christ, and as though God is a master craftsperson, picking up all our imperfection and brokenness, 
and all the imperfection and brokenness of the things we create and filling them and us with the golden light of grace, making beautiful what the world might be as we're fit. And in the extravagant and wild ways of God, even Christ has embraced and entered into this confusing kind of beauty. The risen Christ, when he appeared to his disciples, still had the nail scars in his hands. God has taken up the grief and suffering of humankind and melded it into the very person of God, into the being of God in the person of Christ. Even now, the risen, ascended Christ has human nail scars hands. God has chosen in the extravagance of divine love to usher in a new creation that is new in the way TV pottery is new. God takes up all our scars and our struggles, all the things that mingle together with beauty and delight, make our art profound and our making lovely. God takes all of it up and blesses it and makes it the very stuff of new creation. God has allowed God's self to be scarred, to be imperfect, marred, damaged in the eyes of the world. God has become that for us for all eternity. But in the generative energy of the God of creation, those scars have become beautiful. And so we, with all our scars and all our imperfect offerings, can join God in creating beauty in a way that embraces the groaning and the hurt of the world and that points the way to the healing power that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we're going to um, participate in communion now. And you may have gotten a little communion cup when you came in. If not, um, there is a basket. Joel, raise your hand if you need one, and Joel will bring you one. Um, these are the little all-in-one cups. They're kind of goofy, but they work well when we're outdoors. There's a little gluten-free wafer um, under kind of the top layer, and then the deep cup is under the next layer. So, hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, set for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. With thanksgiving, let us offer God our grateful praise. That's St. Francis, Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. I'm going to read a prayer. Um, it's a traditional communion prayer, and then I'm going to pray for a moment in my own words before we partake of communion. Generous God, overflowing fountain of good, you who live from all eternity in Trinitarian abundance and yet made room for creatures, creating life through the mediating Son and the hovering Spirit, pouring out value on all that you made. You honored us human beings with the breath of your life, making us in your image and likeness to care for the earth in stewardship and love, to live together in hospitality and creativity as a daily reminder of your exuberant abundance. You crowned us with virtue and honor and are now renewing us in your image through the work of your Son. Magnificent you are and strong, giver of splendor. You bless inside a world of curses You heal inside a world of wounds. You save inside a world bent on being lost. You faith 
training and honor you, generous God, overflowing fountain of good, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we now um, take a few moments to participate in communion together as the gathered body of Christ, we thank you for the miracle and the mystery of your broken body and your blood shed, becoming nourishment for us, becoming the fountain of all goodness in our lives. And Lord, just as you embrace brokenness for our sake, you draw us up to you in our brokenness, healing us, uniting us together as your body, uniting us to yourself, and inviting us into your very work of new creation. I pray for every heart here in this moment as we seek the presence of your spirit, as we uh, partake of this cup and this bread, but also going into the coming days and weeks, that you would stir up in our hearts new creativity, new delight in being makers in your new creation. Help us to find ways to do something every day that doesn't compute in honor of you, in honor of your delight in us. Lord, we thank you for the goodness of your good word, and I pray that that takes in deep this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
you were able to receive that as blessing, that God is saying to you, Jesus, I am with you. I have called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. And so I pray that you can carry that out into the weeks to come and that God will work on your heart, um, letting that soak deep into you, whether that be the work of your life as you look back on it, whether it be your creative work that you felt um, shame or inadequacy about, that as you go forward into this week, you'll hear the voice of God speaking blessing and um, delight over that. And with that, go in peace. Mm-hmm.